Hello everyone, today we are talking about five things you might not know about Edinburgh. Don't worry, you've not lost track of the week. This is an extra video this week because funnily enough, I had time on my hands because I was just sitting in the house. So I thought since I had the time, I would give you five more random little facts about Edinburgh you can impress your friends with next time you're wandering about Edinburgh. Plus, I really enjoyed playing with my green screen on the three eerie Edinburgh tales and I wanted to do it again. Just for a bit of fun. As you can see, Merlin is back. He may be going back and forth through this video because he gets restless and he gets bored and he gets up and he goes away and he comes back. So, if all of a sudden he appears and disappears again, blame him. Number five on the list, we are going way back in time to 1972 for the Eurovision Song Contest. Yep, yeah, that's right, the Eurovision Song Contest here in good old Edinburgh. For those of you that don't know what the Eurovision Song Contest is, well, it's exactly what it says in the tin. It's a massive singing song competition which Britain has not won since the 90s. And generally, loads of countries in Europe vote within themselves on a song. That song is then headed over to one city in Europe. Usually, the country that won in the previous year will host it. Remember that, it's important for this story. And then they'll have a big competition where each country will have someone perform that song. Every country votes and then essentially one country wins. And just a little history on that as well. The Eurovision Song Contest has been running since 1956, when way back then, for the very first one, there was only seven countries in it. Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Switzerland. Now, in 2019, there was 41 countries in the final. It was kind of invented for two reasons. One, to bring countries together in, in music and friendly competition. And two, to kind of test and see the limits of what they could do with live TV at the time. And thanks to the Eurovision Song Contest, it gave the world the wonder that is ABBA. Yep, they won. So, back to the story. Eurovision came to Edinburgh in 1972. Now, it wasn't supposed to come to Edinburgh. It was actually supposed to go to Monaco. However, Monaco weren't able to hold it. They just weren't able to provide an adequate enough venue for the competition. So the BBC stepped in and said, OK, we'll do it. We'll do it in Edinburgh. And they held it at the Usher Hall in Edinburgh in 1972. So after us stepping in and helping out, we didn't win. So there you have it. Next time you're walking past the Usher Hall, you can tell someone. Eurovision Song Contest was held in there, 1972. Supposed to be Monaco, they couldn't do it, we did instead. Number four on our countdown of things that you might not know, Ebenezer Scrooge was created by mistake. Now when I say it's created by mistake, I, I don't obviously mean Charles Dickens was in his house, fell over with a pen in his hand and accidentally wrote the entire story of A Christmas Carol. What I mean is he was kind of created through a misunderstanding. Charles Dickens was in Edinburgh and he was walking through the Cannon Gate Kirkyard. This seems to be a theme with writers walking through graveyards and being inspired by the names on the graveyard. For example, J.K. Rowling with Tom Riddle in Greyfriars Kirkyard. If you haven't seen that video about the Harry Potter things to do and see in Edinburgh, I will leave a link in the corner and in the description below. Charles Dickens was apparently walking through the Cannon Gate Kirkyard and he came across a gravestone. Now, I don't know if it was because obviously it would have been carved into the gravestone, so it might not have been as clear to read as he thought, but he thought it said Ebenezer Scrooge, when actually it said Ebenezer Scroogey. However, he also misread further on. He thought it said Mean Man, when actually it said Meal Man. So he's misread a gravestone twice and it's inspired Ebenezer Scrooge, one of the most famous characters in literature around the world. When actually, it was probably a nice man who mealman actually means corn merchant. He sold food. Not exactly the legs that you probably want to leave for any job. But still, he became famous. Kind of. And then, because of this, we have one of the most famous Christmas tales ever, which kind of then set 
how Christmas is celebrated around the Western world today and inspired some of the most incredible versions of the story ever. I think obviously probably the most famous is Alistair Sim one in 1951 but of course we have the Bill Murray Scrooge which is a classic. Disney's Christmas Carol which we definitely can't forget starring Scrooge McDuck and probably the greatest version of a Christmas Carol in the history of the world, A Muppet Christmas Carol. Number three in our countdown, Encyclopedia Britannica was first printed in Edinburgh. This isn't really a very exciting one. It's probably one that you're going to be able to find out when you come here anyway. Encyclopedia Britannica, known the world over as the quintessential encyclopedia collection, was first printed in Edinburgh. In fact, it was printed on Nicholson Street in Edinburgh. First published in roughly about 1768. However, it did have a little bit of controversy about it. Obviously, this is the encyclopedia. It's supposed to have everything in it. You're supposed to be able to look it up and find almost anything in it. For those of you younger and not sure what the encyclopedia is, you know, like the internet, how everything's on there? This is like that, but in what's called a book or a series of books. In lots of books, instead of typing, you would read through lots of books and find it slowly. In fact, the controversy was, and I quote, unvarnished portrayal of the unmentionable parts of the human body. More specifically, this came in the midwifery section of the book, the female anatomy. There was apparently, for the time, quite anatomically correct drawings, even dissections of these. King George III was not happy. Oh, he was not happy. In fact, he was so not happy, he ordered that every copy have those three pages ripped out of them. Fortunately, there are some original copies intact still in existence, and one of them is at the National Library. Number two on our list, there are more statues of animals in Edinburgh than there are of women. If you go back to my video where I took a drive around Edinburgh, we happened to come across a statue of Queen Victoria at the bottom of Leith Walk. And I said in that video that that is the only statue of a woman in the city. That is correct. I say that because on that video, a lot of people commented that there is actually a statue of Queen Victoria on the top of the National Gallery. Yes, there is, but that's not a statue. Well, it is, but it's part of the building. You know what I mean? It's it's part of this building. It's essentially, well, I don't want to say it's a gargoyle, but you know what I mean? It's that sort of thing. It's It was part of the building. It was built in the building. If you include women on building as part of the building, then yes, there's loads. But if you just count freestanding monument statues of women, then there is only the Queen Victoria statue at the bottom of Leith Walk. However, there are loads of animal ones, obviously including Greyfriars Bobby, Wojciech the Bear, and randomly, two giraffes outside the Omni Centre. So, for some reason, even though Scotland, not just Edinburgh, Scotland has countless, countless famous women in its history, we have a statue of Queen Victoria, and that's it. There are countless incredible Scottish women that are just not represented in this sort of way. For example, there's no statue of Mary Queen of Scots. Again, there is on buildings, but there is no freestanding statue of Mary Queen of Scots. Or how about Mary Somerville? Mary Somerville was a mathematician, linguist, translator and astronomer from 1780. St Margaret goes all the way back to 1045 AD. So influential was she at the time, apart from the fact that she became a saint, she started the ferry that goes across the Forth which essentially gave North Queen's Ferry and South Queen's Ferry its name, which still exists today. She was also built a monument by her son in Edinburgh Castle, a chapel called St Margaret's Chapel, which is still standing today, which is the oldest building in Edinburgh at almost a thousand years old. It's still standing. You can go in, you can visit it, but you can't see a statue of her anywhere. I could go on for hours, actually, giving you a list. Kelly MacDonald, Rose Leslie, Annie Lennox, Liz McColgan, and obviously we can't forget Karen Gillan, who is an Avenger and actually saved us all from Thanos. And we don't have a statue to her either. 
And number one on our five random facts about Edinburgh, the Scottish Crown Jewels were lost for a hundred years. So, first of all, what makes up the honours of Scotland is a crown, which dates back to at least 1540. In fact, I'm sure I've read that is the oldest crown jewels in Europe. I'm sure someone will correct me on that if I'm wrong. 75% sure that the oldest part of it is the original gold band that Robert the Bruce was crowned with at Schoon Palace. I could be wrong about that though. There's the scepter, made of solid silver, with three figures supporting a crystal globe and a cut of polished rock crystal with a Scottish pearl on top. I didn't know we had Scottish pearls, but apparently we do. And lastly, the sword, which was presented to James IV and has a blade a metre long. That is the three things that make up the Scottish crown jewels. In 1707, with the Treaty of Union, when essentially Scotland and England became one united kingdom, I don't know if Wales had joined yet, possibly. I think Wales maybe had already joined. I don't know. When the Scots Parliament was dissolved and it was joined with the English Parliament, they were taken and they were locked away in a chest and hidden in Edinburgh Castle and then forgot about. And they remained there for roughly, roughly about 100 years. And out of all the people in Scottish history who could discover them, they were actually rediscovered by Sir Walter Scott. So this was around about 1818. By this point, the writings of Sir Walter Scott had kind of changed the perception of Scotland. It became it more of an appealing place to people go see. People were more interested in finding out about, this is worldwide, they were more interested about finding about the history of Scotland and, and the stories and everything like that. They'd, he'd almost turned it into a more touristy place for people to go see. So at the time, the Prince Regent, who later became George IV, he was so impressed by the writings of Walter Scott that he actually gave him permission to go and search for the Scottish Crown Jewels. And lo and behold, he found them in Edinburgh Castle, in a chest, locked away, exactly how they'd been left a hundred years earlier, wrapped up in blankets, in a chest. They were put on display on the 26th of May, 1819, and since then they have remained on display, and you can go see them now in Edinburgh Castle. Well, not now, because, you know, at this point in time, we can't go anywhere, but once we open up, you can go and see them in Edinburgh Castle. And that is your five random things that you might not know about Edinburgh that you can impress your friends with. Hope you enjoyed that guys, something just to, you know, fill your week a little bit. If you have, please remember, like, comment, and most importantly, subscribe. Keep yourself safe out there. Until next time, bye humans.